everybody, we're almost there. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, this is the concluding uh, section of our, our two-day workshop. And we could have the first slide, please. The next slide. Next slide. Was there almost others? This one? Oh, wait. She's trying to get it on the. Yeah, this uh, that's the next slide. So um, th this session is going to be fairly granular in terms of what we've heard from various listening sections. And it's going to concentrate on, uh, like the VISCRA, the veterinary survey group, we're going to uh what's going on i'm gonna go back go back one slide please so uh like the heavy emphasis on the survey of, from the veterinary consortium is going to concentrate on chapter three of the guide which we haven't really had a lot of direct involvement during these two days and talking about environment housing and management and so I could have the next slide, please. So in that context, uh, th this group of four speakers are going to concentrate on air handling systems com commonly used in Viberia, most of which are constant volume air systems. However, uh, it should be recognized that variable air volume systems offer design and operational practicality uh, and managing in conjunction with heat, heat load and other variables. And uh, we're gonna hear from an expert on uh, distinguishing features of air exchange rates, which we all who uh, have directed Vivarium realize how energy intensive that is for complete air change rates per hour. And he's gonna compare that with air velocity. And in conjunction with new technology, we also have a speaker who's going to talk on enhancing in vigor, rigor and reproducibility and translatability by evaluation of the term we call smart caging. So uh, these four speakers, uh, two of which are we're especially grateful. They're graduates of the School of Veterinary Medicine in Pennsylvania, they're VMDs. And then we have two uh, <clears throat> engineers, chemists, who will talk about uh, greening of buildings using uh, systems that have been incorporated to conserve energy. So I'm looking forward to seeing the uh, uh, four presentations, next slide. So in keeping with, with Gary <laughs> Bornkowski's comments today, uh, and this, this is to the standing committee and the staff at the academy, that uh, we need to accelerate this process, part of which was a two-day workshop, to have the speed and the energy and the conviction to, to actually have the ninth guide of the of the, uh, whatever form it takes on our shelves or in our in our PDFs. So uh, just a reminder that there's urgency. The 15 years is too long. So we hope we all have a guide at least by 2026. So I'm looking forward to the four speakers if we can commence, please. First uh, speaker, Professor Lippman. Yes, thank you. Um, quick question. Can I share my screen so I can use a pointer? I have that option. Can I do that? Go ahead. Okay, thank you.
Can you confirm that you can see my screen? Your screen. Great. Just give me one second. I'll be right with you. Okay. Um, let's get started. So as Jim said, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, one aspect of the guide, which is uh, ventilation, which is obviously something that is uh, near and dear to most of our hearts uh, that uh, administer animal facilities. So first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Neil Lipman, and I direct a large uh, multi-institutional animal care and use program in New York. And just so to stay in this Yes. I'm going to interrupt you. You need to switch your screen. We're seeing presenter view, not the uh, presenter okay. um, Let me see where I can go to get to. Uh, can anybody help me do that? Can you, try, can you try the top left? It says swap displays. See if yeah. I'll take control okay, of the part. There we go. Is that better? Is that better? Yes. Okay. Yes, that's perfect. Right. Thank you. So staying with the theme for Back to the Future, and since I'm in New York City, I will invite you. There is a play on Broadway called Back to the Future, and uh, they use a lot of technology and uh, may lure you to come to New York City. Um, but uh, let's start by, uh, why am I not able to see my next slide? Um, uh, this is obviously becoming challenging. Um, I cannot... I'm going to stop sharing. This is obviously not going to work. Um, bear with me. Um, can you bring back my presentation? I'm sorry. Uh, for some reason, my presentation is not uh, progressing. Anyone? We're coming. One second. Sorry. Thank you. No problem. Lots my fault. Going on. <laughs> We should have tested this. Uh, my fault. Okay, so um, many of you may recognize this slide. This is uh, actually almost 50 years old. And uh, this basically highlights uh, a number of variables that we try to control to ensure our animal, our animal models are consistent. Three of which, which I've highlighted here, really relate to our ventilation systems and why we uh, spend a lot of effort and a lot of money trying to control the environment in which the animals um, are, are maintained. Next slide, please. So let me start by uh, uh, comparing the eight, the current edition with the prior edition. And I should tell you, I served on the committee for revising the guide. And so I have a somewhat of a firsthand knowledge of how the sausage is made. Um, in this particular edition, um, this was the first time in the, in the sections referring to ventilation, we brought up the issue of constant versus variable air volume systems. And for those of you that are not familiar with that terminology, I will, uh, I will review that with you in the next couple of slides. However, um, there was a continuing reference to the use of 10 to 15 air changes per hour. And this goes back as far as to the first edition of the guide from the 1963 predecessor. And so this has probably been in every single version for the last 60 years. And the question I will raise is whether or not we want to still, whether we should still maintain this. So um, in this version, we discussed the concept of fluctuating animal, excuse me, uh, air change rates. And the fluctuation was based on either heat load, which is a primary driver of ventilation, or we use the, we refer to other factors. We did not use the term demand controlled ventilation um, in this particular version of the guide. When we refer to variable air volume systems, we talk about a minimum number of air changes per hour. And the main reason why we would use a VAV system is because of energy circulation, excuse me, energy conservation. Um, one of the things that I never understood, and uh, I never talked to anybody on the 96 committee, was there was a major amount of real estate paid uh, in, on uh, given to the concept of recirculating air. And uh, obviously that in the most current version was reduced. Next slide, please. So what is the main function of a HVAC system when it comes to an animal facility? Um, one of which is macroenvironmental control. And we need to distinguish that from the microenvironment uh, in which the animals reside. Sometimes they're very similar, sometimes they're distinct. So what we're trying to do is maintain a consistent an appropriate temperature. We need to make sure the, the mammals have oxygen and where we control humidity. These systems are also used to provide pressurization control of contiguous spaces. And we do that by, um, by the amount of air placed, uh, provided to a space versus the amount of air that's exhausted from the space. 
And then we use it to remove uh, 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 volatile aerosols and particulates such as carbon dioxide and organic chemicals. And I have a little bit of a cartoon on the, the bottom right corner. Just uh, this is a cartoon from many years ago when we started using ventilated caging uh, compared to static microisolators. And the point made here is that for some caging systems, what's going on in the cage, the microenvironment is very distinct from, from what's going on in the macroenvironment that we're, we're spending a lot of time and effort controlling. Next slide, please. So um, historically, one of the major drivers of ventilation was, it was heat gain, make, make the, the, uh, the animals and the equipment within the room that generate heat, and therefore the ventilation system needed to provide cooling to ensure the temperature within that room was, was stable. And so animals are probably the most, especially in um, high density caging systems or animal rooms that uh, contain a lot of animals. Animals are, are the primary driver of the, the need for ventilation. But we also use other pieces of equipment that generate heat because they have blowers such as cage cage stations, biological safety cabinets, and even the caging systems themselves that have blowers. The other thing you have to be concerned about are external um, uh, heat loads, such as if you're uh, an exterior wall and it's uh, a south facing building or contiguous spaces that have heat generating equipment such as cage wash. So historically, the primary driver of ventilation among other things was, was containing uh, and maintaining uh, appropriate levels of cooling. Next slide, please. So many of you may be unfamiliar with what happens sort of outside of the animal room when it comes to an HVAC system. And I'm gonna give you a very brief uh, primer on, on sort of the essential components of the facility. So first of all, the guide calls for, as it's true in laboratory uh, uh, laboratories, biological laboratories as well, the use of 100% fresh air. So that air is brought in from the outside, whatever ambient temperature it is, uh, is, is in existence and uh, passes through the room once and then is exhausted from the building. And this is very, very energy intensive. So if you look at the bottom of the figure where I have a cartoon of a, of a, of a basic air handling system, you'll see um, three boxes that uh, represent air handlers and Again, you know we have redundancy on our facility. So in this system, we have three air handlers that are providing uh, air to the animal facility. And those air handlers do a number of things. Depends on the time of the year, what the ambient temperature is. They may heat, they may cool, they filter, um, and then they uh, typically will humidify or during hot human months will dehumidify. And the discharge temperature of an, animal, of an air handler is typically around 55 degrees. And so that air is then distributed to the animal facility, the vivarium room, and it's supplied and then it's exhausted directly out of the building. So independent of, next slide please. Um, independent of the season, um, even in the warm months, because the discharge temperature of an air handler tends to be in the mid 50 degree Fahrenheit range, we are typically reheating that air when it comes into the room. So unfortunately, I don't have a, a pointer to, to, to draw your attention to, but if you can go to that, uh, the part of the image that says occupied space zone one, um, you'll see a supply grill. Uh, you'll see above that an insert of a device uh, that looks conical. That's basically a air valve. I'm not going to go into details how those work, but that is a device that will either control a constant volume amount of air to that room. And then uh, if you go over to the ext extract grill and a similar device that's pointing in the other direction, uh, that is controlling the amount of air that's being exhausted of, from the room. And in a modern system, uh, these are pressure independent and, and can be uh, controlled and deliver precise amounts of air. But what you'll also see in that occupied space is a T, which is referring to a temperature, uh, 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 a temperature sensing device that is re that is sending a signal through a sort of a, a feedback loop to a reheat coil that um, is taking that air as it comes in at a constant volume and reheating that air. So in a constant volume system, you've got a consistent amount of air coming into the room, you've got a consistent amount of air going out of the room and the temperature is modulated by how much typically hot water is flowing through that coil. Superposed on this is a building management system or a building automation automation system that is getting all sorts of data and, and has the ability to, to sort of fine control various elements of the, uh, of the system. 
Next slide, please. In a variable air volume system, okay, you'll see the room is set up very similarly, and you can see that that temperature, th uh, uh, that uh, that thermostat, that the temperature sensing probe is doing two things. Now, um, it is sending it, it's sending a signal or it's controlling both the reheat, but further down is a is basically controlling the valve. I, I, I had to put the valve above the reheat, but imagine the signal was going to the valve and the building management system is basically telling how much air is through algorithms is controlling how much air is coming into the room and how much hot water is recirculating for the reheat. And then to ensure pressure control in that room, depending if that room is positive or negative, these two uh, air valves talk to one another. So there's always a consistent offset uh, in volume to ensure either positive pressure or negative pressure within the room. So this is a VAV system. Next slide, please. So the particular, so in the scenario I just discussed with you, the primary driver or the variable that was driving the amount of air in that room uh, in a variable air volume system was, was temperature. But in fact, in modern systems, um, one can monitor other, el other uh, 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 elements and drive that system based on one or a number of these elements. And there are systems now available for vivaria and laboratory buildings um, that, that can measure a number of different elements. Temperature and humidity is one but they can measure uh, organic, uh, organic, uh, volatile organic chemicals such as ammonia, which is a very common off gas. They can measure carbon dioxide and particulates. And so in a, in a DCV or de demand controlled ventilation system, the system is constantly getting feedback from these sensors and it's adjusting um, the amount of air going into that room to ensure uh, these, these um, different elements are maintained within certain levels. And I, as an example, there's a, uh, as you can see on the table on the slide, you'll see the exchange rate. So there's sort of a minimum and exchange rate that the facility can operate at. In this case, it's four to six air changes per hour as an example, and then an upper limit that the system is designed to handle, which would be say as high as 18 air changes per hour. And then for each of these individual compounds or elements, there are minimum and maximum levels that are established. And when you're below the minimum level for any or all of these factors, the system is ventilating at whatever the minimal rate is. Um, if any of these or a number of these uh, values start rising, then you get incremental or increasing levels of ventilation up to the maximum, basically to purge the room and bring, bring the levels of whatever the particular element is back down to its minimal range. And typically in these systems, um, the, the monitoring of these various components are done fairly frequently, fairly frequently at least uh, no later, no greater than every 15 minutes. And what is this? Why does this matter? Because this uh, translates to considerable energy efficiencies. The most uh, uh, HVAC systems, both from a first first expense to lifetime expense because of energy costs, it's probably the single most expensive component of an animal facility. Next slide, please. So here's a real life example that was taken a few weeks ago from a procedure room in our facility that has one of these DCV systems. And what you'll see on the bottom graph is, uh, a, is the ammonia level that is being detected in the room. And then you can see uh, in the upper figure that that is reflecting the number of air changes. And you can see there's a direct relationship. So for most of the, the time that's shown here and time is on the x-axis, for most of the time that's reflected there, you can see the ventilation rates are very low, but when needed, the ventilation scale up. Next slide, please. So um, let me just give you a sort of a high level um, uh, perspective of the architecture of one of these systems. And as far as I know, um, we've, we've put these systems into um, three major vivaria and three uh, laboratory uh, buildings. Um, uh, so th these demand control ventilation systems not only save a lot of money in the vivaria, they're typically used in a lot of wet laboratories uh, because again, they're using 100% fresh air. So the systems that we typically use are, 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 have an architecture like this. So you've got uh, probes in your ducts and typically you've got the supply duct, right? You need a, you need a baseline variable uh, uh, to compare to. And then in the exhaust for each of the rooms that are being monitored, you'll have a probe, again, um, that is going to take samples 
and those samples through through basically plastic piping are going to be diverted through routers to um, sensing devices that have these various sensors that will then send their outputs to the computer system or the application that's running the demand control uh, system. And, and, and this typically operates in parallel with your building auto automation system. So your base system is your building automation system that most modern uh, laboratory buildings have. And this is sort of superimposed and providing additional instruction to the, to, the, um, to the building automation system. Next slide, please. Dr. Lippman, two minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, so you can see various components here of that system. I just wanna point out um, some features that are important. Um, we don't put these sensors in every room because they're very expensive. They need to be calibrated. So there are these sensor module housings that contain these sensors that are plug and play. They can actually, they're removed every six months and set out for calibration. And so therefore you've got multiple rooms being sensed by a single sensor module and, uh, and, uh, and, and housing. And also um, basically the air is being, basically uh, through vacuum pumps is being drawn through tubing to be distributed uh, to these sensors. And this is done depending on the design of the system uh, at least every 15 minutes, but sometimes much more frequently. Next slide, please. So what does this translate to in real dollars? And, and, uh, and so let me give you some, 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 um, some examples. These are generic examples and then I'll progress to an actual vivarium and show you how much money uh, is saved. So again, there are many factors that can determine what the minimum air change rate per hour is. It may be heat load. Uh, it may be the type of caging system that you use. But theoretically, some, some uh, laboratories and some vivaria can go as low as three to four air changes per hour versus the 10 to 15 to 20. Um, and I'm, in general, about 97 to 99% of the time, based on the readings of these variables, the system is ma managed, is, be, is maintained at this minimal air change uh, rate. And this translates to about upwards of a 50% reduction in the amount of air that's used, cubic feet per minute. And um, in the US, on average, uh, air costs because of the heating and cooling, et cetera, and the fans to move it, about five to $7 per CFM per year. So in reality, there's so much savings that the, the upfront cost for these systems Generally, the payback is very short within three to four years. And in fact, at least in New York, where we have um, uh, our Con Ed gives very significant energy rebates. And we're also, like many cities, we're facing fines if we don't reduce our energy. So there may be, it's a carrot and stick approach. The payback be, may be as little as two years. Next slide, please. So here's a real life example. This is a 66,000 cage vivaria um, uh, that. Um, that uh, maintains about 32,000 cages of mice. And in this uh, particular situation, one is it's very important to state that we've been, the system has been in place for at least five years and we've seen no adverse effects on, on the, the, on the uh, stability of the uh, macro environment, nor on any of the various models that we use. Uh, and, and so it's really blind to the user, both the operator of the facility, us, as well as the research staff and the animal care staff. This is translated in this one building to about a 44% reduction in CFM, which relates to about 26,000 CFM, or in New York, everything's more expensive in New York City. They're saving over a quarter million dollars a year uh, in electric costs. And this is based on the type of, uh, of uh, ventilated caging systems that we have and the way they're installed. We can only reduce our animal change, our air change rates to a, a minimum of, of eight because we need to provide as much supply air that's being exhausted from these um, caging systems that go directly into our exhaust system. So it's a significant amount of money. Um, Campus-wide at, at Memorial Sloan Kettering, I was told our annual savings in our laboratory buildings in our Vivaria uh, amounts to about $2 million a year in operating costs. Next slide, please. So in giving final thought to this topic, uh, you know, from, for those that are gonna sit and, and have to deal with the ninth edition, um, I would make the following suggestions. One, and we did not do this with the, with the eighth edition and perhaps people have done it earlier, I would suggest this is so important to a number of factors that uh, consultants are engaged in ASHRAE, which is a professional organization um, uh, um, who sets standards for 
all sorts of engineering design with respect to ventilation, um, as well as Vivaria, um, should be brought to the table. My suggestion would be, and this was also brought up uh, at one of the yesterday's uh, presentations, let's get rid of the 10 to 15 air changes per hour. Uh, engineering standards are very, you know, they're, they're easy to deal with. Um, um, but in fact, we tend by default to, to fall on them rather than go to a performing standard. Standard, um, and, and although we're going to performing standard, it is based on engineering, right? We're, we're, we're engineering, uh, uh, and true engineering is going to dictate what the air exchange rate is. Um, other topics that should be considered in the in the in the uh, future edition of the guide, whatever form it takes, is besides demand control ventilation, which I've discussed. I think environmental stability is extremely important um, and uh, the variability uh, in a poorly administered system uh, can be significant. And obviously there's more and more focus being placed on the animal's thermal neutral zone and what's the appropriate temperature to maintain some of our models. Uh, next slide and last slide, please. Um, I believe the slide set is going to be made available to you, and I've given you some references. There's not much in the literature on this. There are two, two uh, relatively recent papers, and the C Canadian Council of Animal Care has a fairly extensive document on HVAC, and they do deal with uh, demand control ventilation, although their, their perspective uh, is a little bit different, and it's quite, uh, it's quite prescriptive. So with that, I will end, and hopefully I am on schedule. Thank you, Dr. Littman. Um, and thank you for uh, introducing Ashray. And with that in mind, we'll introduce the next speaker, uh, Dr. Tom Smith. Dr. Smith, you're on mute. Okay, thank you very much. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen if I may. Um, okay, hopefully you can see that okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. I want to first say how honored I am here to speak with you today. Um, the proceedings have been very interesting, and this is a very complex uh, topic of how we maintain vivariums and the animal and the occupant health and safety. So I'm going to pose for consideration uh, a risk-based approach to optimizing performance of vivarium ventilation systems. Obviously, airflow is uh, it's invisible and we can't see it, so we don't really understand how important it is to controlling the conditions and the safety of the occupants. Um, I'm the uh, president and uh, chief executive officer for 3Flow, but I'm involved with many different standards on ventilation for safety and health. And my very first job was with the National Institute of Health. And uh, I can tell you, I was 18 years old and I was just amazed when we began working in the vivariums at the different types of animals and uh, all of the activities that went on in those spaces. And it's really a complex environment with many different considerations. Well, one of the things that we look at is the standard, the use and care guide is really looking at those things below the ceiling. And it's very complex when we look at how HVAC systems control the conditions within each of these different types of spaces that may be served by those systems. And one of the important questions is, what is good ventilation? So in answering that question, we have to think about what is the purpose of the ventilation system. And ventilation can really only mitigate certain risk and, and hazards that are associated or airborne hazards in particular. And we have our mechanisms of control with source capture using the right exposure control devices. We have uh, ventilated cages in some cases that control that source right there at the, at the, uh, at the animals. And then we also use the spaces for dilution and removal. And then we're gonna use ventilation for isolation and making sure that we've got the right pressurization and control of airflow distribution between spaces. But at the same time, we have to use the ventilation systems to pro pro provide appropriate space conditions, temperature, humidity, humidity, cleanliness, indoor air quality. These are all important parameters. And so the question becomes how much flow is really required to achieve these objectives uh, concurrently, and risk is going to be one of the big factors. So when we look at vivariums, we recognize that there are many different types of spaces, from animal holding rooms, surgery and procedural rooms, cage wash, offices, labs, 
and clean and dirty corridors. And each of these areas may have different levels of risk and that risk may change over time. So we have to understand where is ventilation critical and where are special safety measures required and will they change over time? And that requires kind of a system in place to do that. So if I look at what drives the demand for ventilation, safety is our number one objective, not only for the people, but also for the animals themselves. And so that can be very complicated to achieve both objectives simultaneously. So we have to understand what types of exposure control devices are appropriate, what type of air change is appropriate, and what isolation or lab pressurization is necessary. Simultaneously, we're going to look at comfort and productivity, and then occupancy and utilization. How often are the spaces occupied? How often are the spaces and the devices utilized? And from that, we can start to look at what is that range of flow and that modulation that's necessary to meet these changing needs in the occupants. So I did a study of the, of the guide, the care and use of laboratory animals, and I identified that, you know, there's a lot of tremendously good information in this document, and it's a really a significant piece of work. It defines some of these engineering uh, requirements, some performance requirements, and practice standards. And really, vivariums are necessary to incorporate all three of these different types of approaches. And I won't get into the details here, but essentially, when it comes to the ventilation systems and those things that are above the ceiling that are controlling the airflow distribution within and between spaces, it's really rather vague. And there's also not a lot of information that's specific about how does a facility manage those systems and what type of maintenance programs are available within that space to make sure that these conditions are controlled and maintained. Now we have ALAC requirements and there are methods of testing and, and information that's gathered on a routine basis, but how do we handle resilience and changes, changes in activities within the spaces and changes to the organization and the operation of the facility itself? So lots of challenges to overcome. Now, when we look at laboratories and we evaluate the essentially the uh, exposure risk, we're looking at airborne hazards, and they can range from negligible to extreme. And we know that we have different levels of protection offered by exposure control devices, a canopy hood offering the lowest level of protection, and your glove box or isolator offering your highest level of protection. But then if we begin to look at the lab design and operating parameters, those two need to change with respect to that risk. And so as a risk level goes up, we need to make sure that the protective capabilities are commensurate with that level of risk. Now, the current standards for ASHRAE and the American Society of Safety Professionals, the American Industrial Hygiene Association, basically indicate that prescriptive air changes per hour are inappropriate. They must be specified based on the level of risk. And so therefore, we're going to try and identify what is that level of risk so that we can derive the required operating specifications. So to do that in laboratories, we developed a lab ventilation risk assessment, working with the University of California and the U, uh, United States Environmental Protection Agency. We developed a lab ventilation risk assessment, which allows us to evaluate the activities in the labs and the exposure control devices to assign a level of risk. And from that level of risk, we can determine the appropriate safety measures. And what I believe we really need though also is a comparable vivarium ventilation risk assessment. And that vivarium level risk assessment will allow us to establish the appropriate levels of risk associated with these different spaces. So if we look at a laboratory, we can define airborne exposure to chemicals, we can, expand, we can identify biological and fire hazards, but we really don't have this associated a mechanism to rate the different levels of risk when it comes to vivariums, because we've got, quite frankly, a combination of these hazards. So we have to define the hazard emission scenario. What's the type of hazard? What's our level of concern? What's the exposure limits? What's the constant, the quantity that could generate the, the contaminant of concern? And what's the generation rate? It's these factors that allow us to apply appropriate ventilation. And we need to understand that concentration profile so that we can mitigate that risk. 
In laboratories, we use this mechanism to evaluate labs, and that allows us to identify the different activities and where we're going to apply these appropriate ventilation specifications. Now, we have a risk matrix. This risk matrix identifies the risk factors and gives us a rating tool. Now, this is a transferable record that then can be used from design through construction into ongoing operations and used as a way to manage change. And we can see that the level of risk is varied within and between spaces. And so having the ability to characterize this risk allows us to more appropriately establish ventilation specifications. If I were to look at the spectrum of risk for vivariums, we see that it is very significant. From the negligible stand, maybe they're just using some cleaning agents, but we've got the generation duration, the generation rate, the impact on the humans, and the impact on the animals. But as we move across the spectrum of risk, we start getting into areas where they're using you know, we're concerned about the aerosols and the allergens and the chemicals that might be used. Maybe they're using radioisotopes. And then there's all the host of pathogens that may be applied to the animals that they're working with within those facilities. And this creates a much different scenario in terms of how we're going to apply ventilation, both from a source capture as well as a dilution perspective. So I would ask the, you know, the committee What's the highest risk activity that we might encounter in a vivarium? And conversely, what's the lowest risk? And if we looked at different spaces, how would we apply this spectrum within a space to see if we've got the appropriate assignment of risk? When we use this assignment of risk for laboratories, we can then apply that risk to specifications so that we get a application of the appropriate air change rates, but also other parameters. Pressurization, for example, the need for monitoring, and a ever popular room ventilation effectiveness. How effective is the airflow in controlling exposure to airborne hazards? And so for laboratories, we've got you know, decades of information to, with, to draw that information. But vivariums, we're going to have to develop these specifications for each of these control bands so that we no longer have to guess we're going to use a systematic process to help us identify and assign and associate these rooms with the appropriate specifications. So if I was to look at a space, I'd say, well, right off the bat, the air change rate is very simplistic. It's the flow divided by the volume of the room. In reality, as we begin seeing concentrations evolve, they begin to uh, ex ex uh, disperse to the room until they fill the entire space. And then when the generation stops, it begins to evacuate. Now, that's the typical concept of air changes per hour, which says that it theoretically is well mixed, that contaminants spread to, in, in, to uh, have a homogeneous concentration throughout the entire volume of space. But it doesn't account for airflow patterns and the spatial variations in concentration that Dr. Kankari is going to talk about next. And so when we look at uh, the ability for the ventilation systems to dilute and remove contaminants, we see some are based on turbulent mixing. And what that means is that all occupants are exposed and all surfaces are contaminated. Is that really what we're trying to achieve? What I would propose is that we're looking at using the supply and the exhaust in tandem to help sweep the contaminants from the space, to use that airflow as the motive force to move the contaminants toward the exhaust so that we're simultaneously diluting and removing contaminants. So just by looking at more effective design and configuration, we get better airflow patterns. So looking into a few spaces we see and looking at the time, I spent an inordinate amount of time looking at ceilings, I'll look at the types of supply diffusers. We've got a four-way diffuser in here, mixing up contaminants. We've got diffusers here in exhaust that are again going to mix up the contaminants. In this particular space over here, we've got a diffuser way over here. That's not going to help dilute contaminants to the space. Now, fortunately, we have some ventilated cages, which are going to help control it at the source, but we still have other sources of uh, airborne contaminants. So we developed a tool to evaluate these spaces and actually characterize the effectiveness of the ventilation and the air change rate in the space. We, we generate an air tracer. It's a, 
very innocuous agent. We use isopropyl alcohol and we dope it with some salt to get a particulate aerosol. And that allows us to both calculate theoretically what the air change rate is and challenge it with an air tracer test. When we do this, we might say, hey, we're paying for four <laughs> air changes per hour or 10 air changes per hour. And as Dr. Lippman said, that has a real cost associated with it. The actual effectiveness of that air change rate may be impacted by the configuration of the space. Two minutes. So if we look at two spaces, one space with a mixing diffuser and one with a directional displacement diffuser, both of these rooms happen to be operating at four air changes per hour. We see under the mixing diffuser, we're paying for four air changes per hour, but we're only getting the effectiveness of 1.5. It means that the airflow is compromised in that space. Conversely, when we have this the uh, replacement with the appropriate type of diffuser, we see that the concentrations are dramatically minimized. And so we're paying for a four air changes per hour. We're getting the effectiveness of seven. So we can do more with less by using the airflow more effectively. And so if I were to design and operate a space or upgrade a space, I would want to go with these directional diffusers because they're quite frankly going to use the air more airflow more effectively. And we got a 67% reduction in exposure dose just by changing the way the airflow is distributed in the space. So a quick video here just showing you that, hey, this is short circuiting. We've got the air going directly from the supply right to the exhaust. I'm sure that doesn't happen in any of your facilities. But if you look, we see it quite often, and oftentimes it's just an inappropriate use of airflow. So now I'll finish with a commentary on um, management of the information. We found that in laboratories, because of the complexity of these systems are getting increasingly more complex, when we go to look at the maintenance and the management of these systems, it's often uh, a problem gaining access to the information, the information that allows us to manage those systems more effectively. And so what we've developed for the American National Standard, uh, the Z9.5, the American National Standard for Lab Ventilation, and I would consider for incorporation in our standard here, would be an information hub. That Vivarium Airflow Management Plan, a VAMP, if you will, uh, assembles all the requisite documents into a set of depositories that allow for easy access to that information. The mechanical drawings, the floor plans, the risk assessments, the airflow specifications, the testing methods, the maintenance programs, and your key operational metrics, and most importantly, your resources and lines of communication. Oftentimes, if we don't know who to talk to, that encounters problems and inefficiencies in keeping the systems working. And particularly when we get into an emergency situation where there may be some shutdown in systems or you know, uh, an, an ambient event that we need Dr. to respond Spence. to, having that appropriate is the right way to go. So I'll close with this for considerations. The guide might incorporate a ventilation risk assessment, it may provide specific recommendations for selection design of the uh, devices, both within the lab, in the vivarium, and in the, above the ceilings. The guide should describe the integration of these air quality sensors. Modern systems use variable air volume controls, as Dr. Lippman said, and the guide should have a specific requirements for a ventilation management plan. And so that brings me to the end. Thank you again Sorry, very Tom. much for your, your time and the opportunity to speak with you today. Hi, thank you so much. So my name is uh, Stepan Baran. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer at Very Sim Life, and um, again, I want to thank for the invitation to talk about this topic. I know that we have lost over a third of our audience, but I hope the people that stayed are going to be interested here. Um, but I'm actually not going to talk about ventilation. I'm going to talk about digital technologies um, and how they would impact the guide and vice versa. Next slide, please. I also want to give a shout out to Brian Barrage, uh, who has helped me uh, bounce ideas about this presentation. We've been working on these technologies for, for quite a bit um, now. Next slide, please. So my recommendation is just up front, going to summarize them. It's really organizing a working group on digital technologies. Um, there was also various phases that were mentioned. So phase three and four are going to have various committees, like the consensus and standing committee. 
So my suggestion would be to have digital technology experts on those committees and then make the guide a living document. And again, maybe not the whole guide, as was already discussed, but portions of the guide, because the technology really moves at a very fast pace. Next slide, please. So one of the things which is already mentioned, right, we have to recognize the using animals for research is a societal privilege. And that makes us responsible for using the technologies that become available to us to enhance the animal welfare and uphold the privilege of conducting research. We also need to understand our duty to harness these technologies, how we can use them to improve animal well being and accept those new responsibilities. Also, in anticipation of the future, digitizing our data now allows us to then use down the road technologies like machine learning and AI um, to its full capacity. So we really have to think um, into the future. And also balancing gui gu really guidance with, with judgment, right? So definitely you need peer review publications, but as fast as technologies move, uh, we also need to use our professional judgments with the guide currently allows us to do that. And I hope it continues to do that as well. And also, the guide really has two potentials here. One, elevate the animal welfare, but also help us address the reproducibility crisis in the drug discovery and help us bridge the translational gap. And when and what I mean by updating the guide with these technologies. Next slide, please. So obviously the guide also uh, takes into account the US government principles and a lot of those were um, presented throughout uh, to yesterday and today. But I just wanted to highlight some of them. So consideration of alternatives, um, especially computer simulation here. So again, this is gathering the data, digitizing the data right now uh, so we can utilize for uh, those simulations. We have to think about relevance to human, right? The reason why we're doing preclinical research is so we can help our patients and get medicines to our patients. Also addressing number of animals that we're utilizing. You know, how can we minimize discomfort and distress? how we can establish humane endpoints, and these technologies allow us to identify novel endpoints, and also the provision of adequate care uh, for veterinary care. Next slide, please. So guide also talks about the three Rs. Um, so here, refinement refers to modification of husbandry and experimental procedures. And as I will go through some of the slides, these technologies definitely impact those and help us refine them. Also, as regard to their reduction, really maximizing the amount of information we can extract from one animal when it's already on a study. And for right now, we monitor the animals maybe one or 2%, um, and otherwise the animals are just sitting uh, in their cages. And I'll talk about the replacement uh, a little bit later on. Next slide, please. So just so we're aligned on the terminology. So one, I just wanna um, suggest that we should digitize and digitalize, meaning that we can access the data um, and the records uh, from our animals for multiple reasons that were actually already stated in the previous presentations, but also for utilization um, on other technologies like AI and machine learning. And also, you know, virtual laboratory animal care. So what is that? So I adapted this um, definition from um, AHA. So virtual care is an extension of laboratory animal care that includes any interaction among in vivo stakeholders that occurs remotely using any form of technology with the goal of delivering quality and effective laboratory animal care. And under that, we have telehealth, which is, for example, like augmented reality, telemedicine, telemonitoring. And the telemonitoring, telemonitoring talks about the smart caging or the digital biomarker technologies. And that's the one I'm going to concentrate on today. But Overall, other digital technologies, the things that apply to digital biomarkers potentially apply to other ones as well regarding the guide. Next slide, please. So what is a digital biomark? So this is a definition from the uh, Three R's Collaborative Digital Biomarker Initiative um, that we published last year. So it's a data collected continuously from unrestrained and uninstrumented animals in their home cage environment. So what is the home cage environment? It's cages, an environment where animals are housed for the majority of their lifetime in a vivarium. Next slide, please. So here, uh, just talking about digital measurements um, with patients and in a clinic and healthcare. 
one of the main reasons why the adaptation is so high um, on clinic is because it's patient centric. It allows us to measure what patients care about, right? If you have a glucose goes up by five points, great. But the patient doesn't necessarily care about it. They want to know, can I walk up the stairs? What is my sleep cycle? So this is why digital technologies, digital measurements are being so so quickly adopted um, in the clinical side. Next slide, please. So on a preclinical side, the value of these digital measurements um, is really multiple, right? It provides a less bias because we have objective assessments of the animals. Uh, it increases clinical relevance. So if we're monitoring respiratory rate in an animal, as we're monitoring respiratory rate in a clinic in a patient, it adds clinical relevance. It also adds operational efficiencies um, and also computationally accessible. Next slide, please. So just an example, what is the flow with these technologies, right? So you have a home cage environment. You imagine this is for rodents, but they can apply to non-human primates, even in ugly cultures to cows. There are technologies available to do that. Um, and you can use any, you know, potential technology, right? You have the cameras, um, RFID, um, and then you use machine learning algorithms to extract data from those, um, from, from, from the video, for example. But it doesn't always, necessary to use algorithms. You can also collect data, for example, like with RFID, like temperature. And then being able to actually provide actionable insights from the data. So that's where decision science and translation come in. But the main point of these technologies is that now we have a holistic view of the in vivo model, right? So traditionally we monitor the animals maybe once, twice a day, but here we can monitor them during the day and during the night and especially, for example, like rodents are most um, active during that time. So it really gives us this holistic picture and becomes animal centric. Next slide, please. So here's just an example of a publication. There's you know, a lot of publications out there uh, regarding these technologies, especially within the last four or five years. But here for a lung fibrosis model, we're able to detect the induction of that lung fibrosis with respiratory rate and activity within hours, where with clinical observations, it takes two to three days. What we also found is that those digital biomarkers, those digital measurements align with histopathology. So now instead of euthanizing animals at each time point that we had here, I think there was three or four, now we can maybe remove one or two of those time points. Next slide, please. So also here, there's a lot of studies on this, right? That when you do cage changes or you handle animals, the activity of the animals uh, changes um, and it can be uh, have a negative impact on the animals. And also on the left-hand side, here you can see the difference between young animals and old animals using the running wheel. So being having this objective continuous assessment allows us to obtain a true baseline of what each strain of the amount animals is like, or even males and females in those differences. Next slide, please. So how do these technologies impact the guide, right? So I think pretty much every part of the guide will be impacted here because these digital measurements provide animal welfare benefits, operational benefits, scientific benefits, and strategic benefits. And on the right-hand side, you have a picture um, a table that asks various questions when you're thinking about bringing those technologies in-house from the IT perspective, from the operational perspective. So as you can see there also impacts again, every pretty much every portion of the guide. Next slide, please. So over this past weekend, I actually reread the whole guide and went through and made I think 60 or 70 so slides where I incorporated the text that I would suggest to um, integrate into that uh, updated version of the guide. So here the blue text suggests the text that I think should be integrated, or at least we should consider integrating it. And this, this is just some examples. So when we talk about the concepts of the three R's, we should also address the tools for the three R's. We should also incorporate understanding of available digital technologies and their applicability. On a committee membership, right, we have various members listed there, but one that's missing is the expertise in digital technologies. And also when we talk about determination of humane endpoints, we should also address assessment of those endpoints. And these technologies allow us to do that objectively. Also, when we talk about careful observes, observations, we can 
potentially change that or consider changing it to continuous observations and making our protocols adaptive. When we have data that comes in real time, as we do in a clinic, we can have the opportunity to adjust those protocols. So again, this would help with that. Next slide, please. So here are just, again, some of the slides that I mentioned, but as you can see, these digital measurements, these digital technologies uh, will impact housing, veterinary care um, facilities, pain and distress section, um, you know, food and fluid regulations, record keeping, emergency care. Next slide, please. And so here are just you know, three examples. Um, so for pain and distress, instead of close observations, we should consider you know, objective assessments and monitoring. When we talk about behavioral studies, if you have the smart caging technology available, you should consider um, using those type of technologies so you don't have to remove the animals from its um, environment. And for additional selected references, I would suggest that we consider adding digital technologies and under veterinary care, adding digital technologies, including telehealth and assessment and monitoring metho methodologies. Next slide, please. So, the guide also talks about the um, replacement as well. And there's not a lot of information regarding that. Even for folks like on iCook, a lot of them, even on IRB, are not aware of some of these technologies. So more recently, um, NAS put out the NHP report, which um, I was in honor of being part of that uh, committee. Um, and we actually included sections on digital measurements, microphysiological systems, um, as well as AI and machine learning. And then a little bit later, um, their report to the director of NIH on alternatives um, also talks about um, integrating microphysiological systems and AI and machine learning technologies. But those references, um, I would suggest for us to consider including in an updated guide. Next slide, please. So one of the things that also we talk about is finances. And it's obviously that's a challenge and for a lot of different reasons those already mentioned um, quite, a, quite a few times today and yesterday. But it's also a cultural shift that needs to happen. So in 2008, so actually I have the book here of Dr. Uh, Pronovost, he came out with a checklist for surgical procedures uh, in, uh, in, in, in a clinic. So then the World Health Organization adopted the checklist in 2009. And since then, it has saved countless lives and reduced the number of errors. And it's being implemented at every hospital. For us, between myself and uh, Dr. Perez Gentile, I recently just counted. So we adopted the surgical checklist. This was a long time ago. And I've presented at over 200 webinars, over 100 workshops. Thank you. And over 550 presentations. And I know there's a lot of other people that have talked about this checklist. But at this point, if I did a survey of does every rodent surgical facility uses the checklist, I'm sure that's the answer is gonna be no. And again, it doesn't require a lot of money. It's just a simple checklist. You can even have it on your phone. So again, for us, it's not just considering that financial aspects that needs to help us to make this change, but also cultural shift. Next slide, please. So again, my recommendations um, for this um, group is to consider organizing a working group on digital technologies and then incorporating digital technology experts into consensus committee, as well as a standing committee, and also making at least a portion of the guide um, a living document. Next slide, please. So here's where you can also get more information, right? So one of the questions comes up, where can you reach those experts in those areas? So you have a digital um, in vivo alliance, um, and also the three R's collaborative, where we have the translational digital biomarkers uh, initiative, as well as um, an AI initiative that was launched uh, earlier this year. And I believe that's my last slide. So again, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk here. Um, and I'd be happy to take any questions if we still have time for that as, as, a, as a group. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Baran. Uh, I'm glad we finished the workshop on the future. So um, one comment I want to make uh, earlier in this session, it was stated that ALAC, it, the uh, air change rate was attributed to ALAC. And obviously, ALAC has nothing to do with air change rates. ALAC only uses the guide and the air change rate 
number was given in the guide. So I just want to make sure that nobody attributes that to ALAC. Um, I don't really think we have time for questions right now. We don't have any that were um, submitted. I have some seed ones, but we'll pass up on those. And I'm going to turn it over to my co-chair, Jenny Lofgren, to sort of sum up this workshop. But I'd like to thank the speakers of this session for really uh, taking us into a very important area for consideration for the committee for the new guide. Jenny. Great. Thank you. Okay. I think our closing slides are coming up now. Um, thank you everyone for sticking with us through this two day workshop. Um, we wanted to just give you a, a few last minute um, closing words from myself and Jeff. Next slide, please. Um, so again, the goals of the workshop were to share the output of the standing committee with the guide stakeholders. And as we mentioned, the agenda was really shaped around focus areas that were identified during listening sessions in the Vicra survey. Um, mm -hmm. And you saw this when we first scoped the workshop goals at the beginning. Next slide, please. Um, as we were planning for the workshop itself, it was clear that there were some topics that were not going to be able to fit in the footprint of the workshop in this in the two-day format. And so we wanted to make sure that it was highlighted that were a number of topics that we do recommend um, require further discussion um, as we head into phase three. Um, so that's the harm benefit evaluations and ethical review, rigor and reproducibility, a culture of care, Additional depth um, in the OCH health area, especially considering um, topics for um, associate well being like mental health and, as we heard about earlier today, um, compassion fatigue, as well as additional depth in behavioral management programs. So, we had um, some really great data today around uh, potential updates to handling housing and care of animals. Next slide, please. There were also a number of themes that um, came about during the workshop that we heard um, through a number of different presentations, and that was uh, finalizing the format of the guide. So we had examples of static, dynamic, core documents supplemented by more agile guidance and even living documents. Um, so we'll need to work through all of those pieces uh, to come to a conclusion. We also had different approaches to use of must, should, and may, as well as an alternative of using declarative sentences. Uh, we had a lot of great examples of performance standards, and it's very clear this is something that the community holds dear and wants to continue to see moving forward. Um, there might be ways to make that easier, potentially ways of sharing established performance standards between institutions like we heard about at CUSP. There could also be a role for Basher. Basher, sorry. Um, uh, and also considering if we lean in strongly to performance standards, particularly when it comes to behavioral management, this is going to require trained individuals who can effectively design, implement, and monitor such performance standards. Uh, cephalopods came up a number of times. Uh, we heard a great modernization example for three hours definitions and also opportunities for the next version of the guide to further build congruency with a global approach to animal care and use programs. So we hope that these will also be considered as additional topics moving forward. Next slide, please. So for next steps, uh, first of all, we invite all of you to participate in a survey that you'll receive afterward um, to give us feedback on the workshop itself. Um, this workshop has been recorded and there will be written proceedings um, that will be reviewed and published by the National Academies and available on their website, um, we're hoping uh, by the end of September, 2024. The proceedings will then be used by Academy staff, standing committee, consensus committee, and sponsors to shape a proposal for the next iteration of the guide. These groups may also convene additional workshops or deeper dives into topics that require additional exploration. Next slide, please. So just to remind you, we're in phase two. It's where the little we are here asterisk is. Um, but we'll soon be heading into phase three, all under the guidance of the standing committee. Can I have the next slide, please? So this uh, consensus committee uh, will begin their work uh, as we head into the summer of 2024, defining the study and then working through all of these stages and ending in the dissemination of the new guide. Next slide, please. Uh, with that, would you like me to do the thanks? Or... Okay. <laughs> I wanna take this time to uh, thank the workshop committee members and also the uh, standing committee I want to take the time to thank the workshop committee members and also the members of the standing committee. There were a number of uh, 
committee members that were not here at the workshop, but actually uh, helped put this together and help put the listening session summaries together. Next slide. I'd also like to thank the speakers. Um, and this reminds me, I really want to thank the National Academy staff. We had over 40 speakers and we had very few glitches for a conference like this that was primarily virtual. Um, next slide. And these speakers covered a range of topics, as you heard, and also represent um, some sister organizations and some people that are not in our primary animal use community. And I want to especially uh, thank them. Next slide. And I want to remind people that the work of the standing committee is ongoing. You heard a lot of different topics and there were a lot of references mentioned, but there are a lot more references out there that we want to make sure that people send in. Uh, if you feel that there's information that you want the standing committee to see, um, please send in those references. And with that, we'll conclude. <laughs> we'll conclude the meeting. <laughs> Thank you.